Hello, I'm Susie Menkes from Condé Nast, and I want to talk to you today about Condé Garçon, Christian Lacroix, and Martin Margiela. Ah, Martin Margiela, black and white. How could I not choose this? It was something that brought out the worst in myself and all other journalists, because we arrived and we were ushered either to one room or to another, where, if I remember rightly, there, there were candles glittering. But the one thing that you could grasp is that one was black and the other was white, and it was absolutely dead obvious that your rival had been identified as somebody to go to the white one and that I had been pushed off to the black one. Don't ask me why I thought this, but that's the way that journalists think about each other, that she's got or he's got the scoop and I've missed it. So I remember arriving immensely disgruntled. I actually think I got the black deal. But whichever, we didn't see very much of the show because it was all done by um, very small lights, basically first by candles and then by a kind of lighting that um, was very much beloved by this house when you couldn't really see very much of it. But oh my goodness, you had such a feeling about the show, such an extraordinary thing. And you know, you've got to put this against the um, context of it was the end of the uh, 1980s, that vulgar, loud, punchy era. And this was so fantastically different. It was so, when Martin Margiela had an exhibition in Paris, and looking back, you realised how many amazing things he was doing in this particular show, using kind of um, fabrics like um, translucent materials or things that were um, plastic, used a lot of plastic. And y you saw them, but you didn't realise at the time that you were seeing something that's quite revolutionary. But there's no doubt that what he showed absolutely caught the spirit of the moment, that the vulgarity and the loudness and also the fun and the drama of the 1980s just disappeared like that. Why did he do the black and white? Well, don't ask me, because this was not a designer who ever, ever came and told you what to say or even answered a question or you always had this hat on so it was hard enough to find him. And if you did struggle backstage, as all good um, journalists do, and go and follow the hat and find him, he had absolutely nothing to say. But you see, he said it all with the clothes, with the whole feeling of how women did not have to be pushing themselves outward into the world, that they could be something that was stepping back a little, something that was beautiful and gentle and original, and that was part of themselves and not something that was, hey, this is me, this is the Martin Margiela story. I think looking back, he was one of the great designers of the second half of the 20th century. And um, I, my dream is that he suddenly comes back, that he doesn't tell us anything about this, of course, it's not possible, but um, that he suddenly there's a mystery show going on and that there it would be, he was, had a thought and wanted to bring it back to life. It may never happen, but perhaps he'll see this film and feel inspired. But when Martin Margiela came onto the scene, he was expressing something about youth. Maybe it was that, but it was more than that. It was extraordinary things. It's about something more, less careless than what had been going on in fashion in the 80s. It was about things that now seem so incredibly modern. M m remaking clothes from the existing ones. And um, he told me once, I can't remember when it was, that his father, he'd watched his father's um, jacket being taken to pieces and bits of it used for a new jacket. And you know, when you think of him now, this is so obviously in his head and in his mind, and it's so relevant to today. All these people who think they've just discovered the idea of m making over their m parents' clothes or clothes that they've worn previously or that are on show from stores who are trying to cash in on that idea. Do they have any idea that Martin Margiela was not just first, but he was the most deepest, most thoughtful, most interesting person on this category? And we're talking now about, can we be talking about 30 years ago? Jolly nearly. And 
I dare say it myself, that I was one of the few journalists who was interested always in looking for new things. Sure, we wanted to see what Dior was doing this season, but when I heard there were new things, and there, there was always the same number of us, there were always the Hamish Bowles, and there were always a certain number of people, and not more than about 20, I think, who would go to these places. And that was the beginning of it all for me. And um, it was, you know, it's one of those memories that's with me forever. And what's so strange for me is that when I see people writing about it now, you know, who are people who are 30 years younger than me, they do these very deep researches and all the rest of it, but they don't get it. They don't get it. They get the name of every model who was there, which I've never even known. They've got, to, they tell you every color that the fabrics are made by and indeed what the fabrics are, but they didn't, don't get it. They don't understand what an incredible thing it was. Because, you know, at that stage, frankly, as now as well, a lot of um, French people, particularly middle-class people, very correct people, were terrified about the suburbs. They never went anywhere near them. They were convinced they were filled with people who were druggies, who would steal their money and everything else. And, of course, I'm not saying that was said publicly, not at all. But deep down, there was this cleft between the two. And somehow, Martin Margiela caught that moment. If anybody looked now at the number of people we crammed in, how there was this little tiny staircase to get out, it was all terribly dangerous and lots of fun. I truly believe that the, my um, partner, as you might say, in, in writing um, at Le Figaro magazine, I don't think she ever went to a single uh, show of any of these what you might call unusual designers. She stuck firmly with the people that her readers would understand, the Dior, the Givenchy, those things. Yeah. And in general, you know, this is what people can't understand, which is that shows were not very accessible, and that, that certainly the Margiela shows were never very accessible. You often physically had to struggle to get into them or round them or climb over something. Off schedule in those days mostly meant after the civilised hour for shows was ended and you were going off for a drink. So in other words, many things would happen at, say, 7 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock or even later. Um, but these were not names that were on the official calendar. You know, it was, they took a long time to get on there. So you would, there was a divide, definitely. Yeah. And of course, some of the people who seemed like great hopes for the future, um, when they first appeared, sort of fizzled away and, and didn't happen. I suppose Christian Lacroix's shows were just so different from everything else that we saw. They were so vibrant, they were so theatrical. And of course, years, years later, he said to me that fashion was a mistake for me. And it's so strange, looking back now, remembering all those amazing things he did, to realise that he was really thinking about being an artist in fashion. He wasn't really thinking about making clothes for all of us to wear. He drew from what he had lived through as a child and also what perhaps his parents or grandparents had told him about the way people dressed in the past. So very different. You've got to put it in the context of the fact that it, this was in the 80s. It was a very um, different period in fashion. And yet he was thinking back to this childhood memories, really. What were the main things in the 1980s? There were three of them. Bling, bling, and bling. And that's what we saw at the fashion shows, that there was tremendous amount of glamour, but at the same time, it was that sort of, not even theatrical, filmic kind of glamour. And uh, Christian Lacroix's view on that was quite different. There were a lot of jewellery and accessories and all those things, but they didn't come in that category of, well, let's put it crudely and say they didn't look vulgar. He was with Jean Patou early on, Christian Lacroix, but I don't think that he ever really identified with it as a house. And he certainly must have been very thrilled and excited to be on his own doing this. Like so many designers, I would say that a lot of it is about dreams of childhood or memories of childhood. I was at the Herald Tribune. This is uh, the year I joined was um, uh, 1988. So this is, would be my first round of shows. And um, it, the things I would have noticed are an amazing sense of colour um, from Christian Lacroix, also a texture of... But it's all based in this show that I'm looking at now 
on something that is really quite um, understandable as clothing. It's not weird clothes or dramatic clothes or even theatrical clothes. They are clothes that you could wear if you had the money, of course. And always from Lacroix, this sense of decoration, which was pretty unusual. I'm not sure that Lacroix himself was, although I'm sure he was attached to various of the um, people he had, I don't think that he actually sort of launched somebody in a way that other designers might have done at this exact same stage. But I think that was the point then, that this was a um, hang, hanging on, should we say that, from the um, time when all shows were like that, really, that they had house models, they were called at the original thing, and they were people who were sort of destined to show the spirit of the designer and normally worked with them right through the year, so that would do the, um, not just the shows, but also wear the clothes, try them on in front of the designer and be really part of the whole business. It's much harder now to divide the ready-to-wear from the haute couture. But in those days, there was an absolute division that the haute couture was something you almost sort of lowered your voice and shh, so as not to disturb anybody. And the models as they came out were very, very um, gorgeous, I suppose the word. Every single bit of them, every flower in the hair, every trim in the fur, all these things were part of a telling an entire story. Of course, I'm surprised at seeing how dated a lot of it looks now, particularly the use of fur, but there's also a kind of um, freedom and elegance, almost as though the models were dancing, looking very happy. This, remember, was the period just before Comme des Garçons came along and people started, models started striding down the stage, often looking quite aggressive, but certainly not smiling and being charming. So it, this was a watershed moment, really, end of the 80s, which were so full of character and energy, and into the 90s when it was much more sober. Actually, if you look hard at these um, things, as I've been looking now, they're, then they don't look dated, they look perfectly modern. There are always those little bits of frills and furbelows that were very much Lacroix's thing. But the, uh, the basic clothes that going with that, the way they were cut and so on, were actually perfectly normal if you look at them hard. I think it's important to understand what haute couture meant to the French and also to the buyers, to the people who chose their clothes from these collections. That, you know, Christian Lacroix was not trying to be Comme des Garçons. They're completely different categories, absolutely different. And I'm not saying one was better than the other or one was more, more elitist than the other, but they just were different. And this show has got a great collection of different fabrics, but cut in a similar way to the body. And therefore, it, the clothes seem wearable. People often have looked at Lacroix and said, how is anyone going to wear that? But actually, these clothes are perfectly wearable by the um, people who wore those kind of clothes to those kind of events. We had pretty strict rules about when we had to write. And mostly the ordinary shows would be, the reports on them would be closed by about five o'clock in the evening. So there'd be a massive rush for a three o'clock show, which probably started half an hour late. It would be a mad frenzy to get out and do it. And remember, we're talking about getting out and doing it on a, not on a digital anything, but actually with an old fashioned way of doing it, with your hands. Um, but I wrote about the delicacy of the decoration and how much of it there was, but how it was somehow used in such a way that you didn't feel that you were smothered or overwhelmed by it. But um, there again, I, I was never looking at it. Actually, I don't even look today at uh, fashion shows about myself personally. No. And certainly for that one, I was thinking not at all of myself. It was judged on how it built up the image of Lacroix, how the clothes looked, in fact, quite casual. I mean, I know, Everyone would laugh at me if I say that now, but they're relatively speaking casual clothes. There's one thing about that early Christian Lacroix show which is so exceptional, which is this a sense of joy. And one of the sad things that I find at the moment in fashion is that there's so little of that feeling of joy, of excitement, of 
was wanting to show things to the world, choosing the colours. It's really an artistic approach which becomes more and more difficult for designers to do because they have so many things curtailing them and telling them what they should be done. Don't forget the clothes for women who go out to work and have you made any hats? There's an intervention now between what the designer does in her or his dreams and what the bosses say have got to be there. So I think maybe things are a little bit harder today. I'll never forget the Lumps and Bumps collection of Comte des Garçons. I don't even know if it was really called that, but that's how we saw it, this extraordinary collection of clothing which caused a feeling of alarm and, and being scared and being worried because of these extraordinary changes of shape. We all called it this Lumps and Bumps collection. I, I don't know where it really came from, but I do know that it was a moment when people felt that we were being shown something more than clothes. Now, if I say that now, it doesn't seem so strange because people are always doing things that you might say are beyond fashion. But from Ray Kawakuba of Comme des Garçons, there was something so private and something so female and something so extraordinary about what she was showing us. And I, I don't think any of us grasped it at the time. And although it's gone on, to be used as a symbol of something. I, I, I'm not sure to this day that we really got it, and certainly she's not going to tell us. For some reason, we all took it, or some of us took it, as being something to do with cancer, of having some protuberance, something about your body which wasn't right, and that you had to sort of overcome this terrible thing that had happened to your persona by acting normally and wearing things normally, but showing these lumps and these bumps. And I don't know, because you can't talk to her less than ever now about what was really meant at the time, but I never have really understood what the purpose was and whether it was as deep as we all thought it was at the time. I suppose what happened in the mid-80s was that there was a sudden reflex against the way that women were dressing in such an enormously vulgar and dramatic way, not just women, men as well. And that it was a sort of balance to have these designers which were not at all outlooking, and not at all, certainly not vulgar at all. It was the time when the various of the um, Japanese designers came to the fore. It was the feeling you got when you saw this collection, as though there was something very deep and poignant and exceptional going on. And I believe that for this show, there was a real feeling of shock because there seemed to be such a clear message behind the clothes. And the clothes were not unwearable. Certainly, people who wanted to buy the clothes as they were and then remove the lumps and the bumps could have done so very easily. The clothes were not peculiar in any way. But there was something so deep and so meaningful in how they were presented. I think I heard people actually gasping. I might have been one of them. And I think people don't realize this, that Ray Kawakuba, from the moment that she designs something, she envisages it not just as something for people to gasp over in the audience because it's so amazing, or to be shocked by because it looks like lumps and bumps could be to do with cancer or something terrible like that. But at the same time, she has a vision of how these clothes can be turned into normality, not her normality, but ours. Ultimately, this show, when I look at it now, I don't feel shocked now, and yet I can still remember the reverberation of how shocked I felt at the time. I think all you ask for when you're doing a review is somebody with a point of view, with something to express, something to say, and m more often than not now, um, somebody who's been at the business, like Ray Kawakubo, for a long time and who is able to express the same vision in different ways each season. It's really a remarkable achievement to be able to do that. And certainly, the whole period that we're looking at now, and for quite a good time afterwards, about 10 or even 12 years afterwards, was actually perfectly normal clothes, but somehow given an edge of non-normality. So you see, behind it all, we know that there is a theme, there's a meaning, there's a thoughtfulness, there's an attitude to women 
but she never puts it into words. She puts it into clothes. Certainly, I think everybody feels about Rei Kawakubo that she's just extraordinary. I think she's now had 50 years, in fact, I'm certain of it, 50 years in fashion, but did she have a party? Did she announce it? Did she say, this is my 50th year designing clothes as if? She continues to be with her kind of beautiful silence. My own view is that sex comes not from without, but from within. And that anybody wearing a lot of the clothes, which after all fit the body in an extraordinary way when it comes to Rei Kawakubo, that you can be sexually aware in them. But I don't think ever sexually alluring. I don't think that Rei Kawakubo, well, this is true also of many female designers, trying to force something, to make something attractive to men, just not in her calendar. She works always with the same people, that they're part of a fashion family, but not in some sort of frivolous way, or not even in any just sort of deep friendship way, but in a way of really um, minds working together. When I look at the Lumps and Bumps collection now, I ask myself why we all made such a thing about it, because actually, it, it doesn't remind me of anything because there's nothing that she's ever done that's ever been something that someone else has done. But at the same time, these, the lumps and bumps are, are not so extraordinary, are they? They're not so, they don't really suggest that somebody is striving against cancer. They, all the things that people said at the time don't really seem to be something that we are looking at now. I have realized that there must be something deeply wrong with me. Do you know, I love fashion shows. I adore them. I want to see every fashion show I can, however tired I am, even when they're showing running so late and it's half past ten at night and I haven't eaten. And then the show starts and the magic begins. I don't want them to make fewer shows. I want them to make more.